with the vision, a nation will flourish, which is why I'm very concerned that we don't buy into an election season which essentially becomes don't vote for the other guy. Does somebody have a vision for our country? Does someone have a, a vision for our state? Does someone have a vision for our city? Does someone have a, a vision for our county? I'll tell you part of mine. It would be that the people of God do not act like everyone else, but we are like lights in a dark world. That we're like salt on a tasteless piece of meat. That when everyone else goes nuts, we go peaceful. We're peacemakers. Now our vision should not just be we don't want their kingdom. It's that we want his kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven. We're going to go to Habakkuk chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read from the New King James. And thrilled that you are here and ready to get into this semester that's coming up here. Verse 1, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Now, before I keep reading, let me just give you the backdrop on this passage because I'm about to talk about vision. And before I do, I just want to make sure I'm breaking down the actual passage because it's going to take a minute to really get this gospel centered. But let me just kind of bring this to the scriptures. In the chap first chapter of this book, the prophet Habakkuk, he is troubled because his people Israel are not being godly. They're not being virtuous. They're not being right. They're they're off track, and he's crying out to God. He's burdened about this. He's like, God, what do I do with all of the, the blatant ungodliness and unrighteousness and injustice among your people? And God basically says, oh, don't worry. I'm going to judge my people, to which it's like, oh, okay, well, that's a relief. But then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, when I judge them, I'm going to judge them with the Babylonians, to which Habakkuk says, wait, they're even worse than the Jews are. They're even worse than the Israelites are. This doesn't work. I don't like this at all. Like you're, this, is, this is a terrible idea to which God just kind of lets it sit there for a minute. And that's where we come here in verse one when he says, I'm standing my watch and I'm listening to hear from something from the Lord. Now, by the way, I, I just want to pause real quick because you're going to be hear me saying things for the next several months. This reminds me a lot of the election season right now. A lot of the election season we get in. I don't know that I sense a lot of vision from people. What I sense is anti-vision. We don't want that guy. We don't want that lady. We don't want this person. And yet what we find here is we've got a man that rises up and he's got this burden in his heart. And he says, God, what do you say? And in that context of waiting on God to speak, we now come to what's a little more famous in verse 2 when it says, then the Lord answered me and said, and this is what I'm hoping happens today, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. It's a fascinating verse because this was an oral culture where the majority of the population didn't even, they couldn't even read or write. And yet he says to the prophet, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Verse three, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Everyone say wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. But the just shall live by his faith. What a spectacular passage. Before we're done today, I'm praying that some of you will be motivated to take out your phones or take out a journal or take out a piece of paper or to go home to pray and to write the vision and make it plain that, that the one who reads it can run with it, that mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and roommates and, and business owners would write the vision and make it plain so that the one who reads it, including you, can run with it. Today I want to talk about the power of vision, the power of vision. God help, in Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. My mind is on the Florida field right now because next service, the, the Gator football team will be here, and when I was a freshman at UF, I went to my first ever college collegiate football game at Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. If you go 
exactly 116 miles south of Florida Field, and you went back in time in the 1960s, there was a man named Walter that was driving around what you might call old Florida, driving past shacks and piles of manure and dogs and cows and just little pieces of land in the middle of a very sometimes swampy, very humid area of mid-Florida, not really known for much of anything, but he was driving a friend of his in a car as they were looking out the windows, and he would point to different places, and he would say, you see that spot over there? In just a few years, that land is going to be worth a hundred times what it's worth right now. You see, right over there, I'll tell you what's going to happen is there's going to be hotels and swimming pools and all sorts of resorts and all sorts of places where people are going to come from all over. They're going to be chomping at the bits to get here. And he was telling his friend, because he said, I'm, I'm going to go and doing this and I'm getting these things funded that I'm a, something that I'm about to do. But if I were you, I would get in on it now and I would go buy this land now because I'm telling you, I can see it. And the guy that was with him, he was like, uh, he, he confessed at this other man's funeral. He's like, I'll be honest, I, I did not go buy a bunch of the land and I did not go buy the property because I just couldn't see it. Well, of course, this man, Walter, is better known by a different name. His name is, in our minds, this would be Walt and his last name would be Disney. And of course, he would spring up a talking mouse and a duck and I'm not sure what Goofy is, what's he, a doll? He would, he would have all sorts of other stuff that would come and and he would turn the Orlando area into the number one destination on all of planet Earth for vacations, as people literally from around the world will gather, even today, even today, after church, hopefully, but even today, they will gather together today. And the reason is because Walt, as he would say, he saw it before he saw it, which is why he saw it. Vision is about when you see it here before you see it here, which is why you eventually see it. Vision is an interesting thing, and of course, the prophet we're reading is going to say the just shall live by her faith. The just shall live by his faith. Vision is the ability to see the invisible before it's visible to make it possible. If you're wondering who the first visionary was, it's he who calls things that are not as though they were. Because that's what God does. He, he speaks to fishermen and says, your name is Simon, but you are Simon, but you will be Peter because on this rock I'm gonna build something. And you fish for fish right now, but you're, you're going to fish for men. He, he looks at, at normal business owners, and he looks at them, and they may feel very ordinary. He says, you are a man of God, Travis Lowe, because you can see things in people when there's a vision that's there. When you see it before you see it, that's when you're eventually going to see it. Vision is sight beyond sight. It's to see the future from the present, oftentimes in light of the past. It's, it's a big idea. It's, it's a clear, compelling, needingly, it needs to be practical. It's a clear, compelling picture of the future that, that mobilizes and animates your heart. When Martin Luther King Jr. was at the Lincoln Memorial, he saw something. He, he saw children, and he saw a nation, and, and he saw people. He saw it before he saw it, which is why there's things we've seen because of what he saw first. And he said it. Martin Luther King saw something. Phil Vischer saw vegetables like tomatoes and cucumbers talking about Bible stories, and he created the Veggie Tales. He saw something. In the 1990s, Steve Spurrier saw what you might call a, 
a vision of fun and gun. He saw a Southeastern Conference that was ruled by boring offenses of the past, and he injected fun and gun into it that when someone came to Florida, they weren't just coming to, just to, to come. They were coming because they wanted to be a part of something that was, they, they would run, I mean, I was at games where the score was, was run up like 80 to 3, and it was fun, and it's what happened with Walt Disney where he saw something in Central Florida. Contrast that with, with my vacation this week. I was on vacation, and I met someone, and I'm, obviously I was thinking about this message, and I asked one of the people that, that was near me, uh, hey, w- what's the vision for your life? And they're like, ah, I don't know. I'm just trying to go get some of the buffet. I said, no, but let's think a little deeper. And he, and he said, man, I'm not, I'm not trying to think deep. I'll be honest. My, my vision is I, I, I kind of live for cruises. I, I live to go on cruises, to which in my mind, in my heart, I'm thinking, What a sad life that you live for a cruise, that you live for an all-you-can-eat buffet. What a sad life. I'm not sure what the vision is. I I, I live for cruises. I'm on my fourth marriage. And and I, I I felt for this man because in Proverbs chapter 29, maybe the most famous vision verse of Scripture, it says, Where there is no vision or without a vision, the people perish. But it's not just people. It's without a vision, churches perish. Or or some people would say, in preacher circles, they say, without a vision, people look for another parish. Without a vision, a business perishes. It might be slowly because a lot of businesses are living on the laurels of their past successes. A, A lot of departments are living on innovations of five years ago. A lot of people are living on the ideas of 15 years ago, but without a vision, businesses eventually perish, and families perish, and without a vision, marriages perish. What is the vision for your marriage? Without a vision, children perish. What's the vision for your children, moms and dads? Without a vision, semesters perish. I realize most students aren't back yet. They're gone right now, but any students that are watching online right now, without a a vision for your semester, semesters tend to just perish. They just tend to, to wither away. But with vision, it's the opposite. With a vision, people flourish. With a vision, families flourish. With a vision, marriages flourish. With a vision, businesses flourish. With a vision, a microchurch flourishes. With a vision, a nation will flourish, which is why I'm very concerned that we don't buy into an election season, which essentially becomes, don't vote for the other guy. Does somebody have a vision for our country? Does someone have a a vision for our state? Does someone have a vision for our city? Does someone have a a vision for our county? I'll tell you part of mine. It would be that the people of God do not act like everyone else, but we are like lights in a dark world, that we're like salt on a tasteless piece of meat, that when everyone else goes nuts, we go peaceful. We're peacemakers. We bring the kingdom of God on the earth as it is in heaven. My, My vision, our vision should not just be we don't want their kingdom. It's that we want his kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven. Why do some people flourish? Why do some families flourish? Why do some businesses flourish? Why do some lives find a way? And the answer is they tap into this concept of vision, the power of vision. So the question I, I want to just answer quickly today is, what is, what is it about vision that, that changes a life? I've got three thoughts. The first is this. Vision, first, it is the fuel of self-discipline. Vision is the fuel of self-discipline. Now, we live in an era of lack of self-discipline. Put someone in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet, and you've got tragedy on your hands. It's, it's the fuel. Vision is the fuel of self-discipline. Proverbs 29 says, without a vision, the people perish. This word perish means to, to cast off restraint. In the New King James, it says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. Nothing disciplines a life like vision. Nothing. Nothing disciplines somebody like when you are clear about where you're going. Dis- what is discipline? Discipline is it's self-imposed standards. Let me get clear. It's standards that you put on you, not somebody else. It's when the vision is inside of you, there's a, there's a compelling purpose, objective reason burning inside of you. You want that. 
It's, it's that girl that you want to ask out because you want to marry her, and there's a lot of other girls coming along the way, and, and in your past, you used to flirt with everything that had two legs, but now you've got a vision. So now you say no. Now you've memorized Bible verses like, get behind me, Satan. Now you've memorized things to, to, to help you. The key to finding vision is, is hearing something from the inside, but a key to life is finding a vision that imposes on you self-discipline. I'm going to say it again. Self-discipline. This is the fruit of self-control. It's one thing when someone else controls you. It's one thing when a boss controls you. It's one thing when you, when you really want the bonus. It's one thing when someone's con- controlling you with money or they're controlling you with whatever that is. You don't want to get a ticket. It's something else when you live out of vision because that imposes on you something that, that you make the decisions yourself. So let me give you an example. So you're on vacation, and, but you've got a vision. Your vision is you're trying to lose 20 pounds. When you're trying to lose 20 pounds... That's the vision. And so you can see it in your mind. that You're seeing you 20 pounds less, right? And some of you are like, I don't need to lose. I need to five. And some of you are like, five, I need 50. Whatever it is. But let's say that's the vision. When vision works is when that is a clear vision. When you're at the all-you-can-eat buffet and you see mac and cheese and chitlins and fried chicken and you see all the stuff and, and you're like, you're either only going once or you're getting a small plate because you already know. You're, like, you're just like, no, we already know. Like I've heard that there's some families that do this so that they don't overeat, they do small plates, right? And so what's happening is when you've got a vision, vision is the fuel of self-discipline. So how do you not eat more than you should? It's when you've got a vision, wait, no, 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 I'm not going back for the third time because I've got a vision of I'm trying to fit in my wedding dress, I'm getting married in six months. And God knows I got to get in that dress. For the rest of my marriage, who cares? But at least on that day, I am squeezing in that sucker is what I'm going to do. So vision helps you with decisions. Vision helps. When you've got a vision, you know what you eat and you don't eat. You know what you read and what you don't read. When you've got a vision, you know what shows you watch and don't watch. When you've got a vision, you know what books you read and don't read. When you've got a vision, you know what time you get up in the morning and what time you go to bed at night. Because you've got a vision that's, that's the fuel of self-discipline. This is why, put 1 Corinthians 6.12 up on the screen for me. I'm not sure, I, I think I've got it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, says it like this. I have the right to do anything. Now, this is one of the principles of, I can do anything I want. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet. I can eat anything else. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is what? Can you eat a 15th piece of chicken? Yes. Is it beneficial to eat a 15th piece of chicken? Probably not. You're like, well, what if it's a, one of those Publix, what are they called? Uh, popcorn chicken. I, I'm not sure. See, see everything, there, there are some things that are allowable, but they're not beneficial. It, you might not need the bacon and the biscuits and the gravy and the butter on top of five croissants. You've got the right to eat. It might not be beneficial to eat all of that if the next day you're running a marathon. If you've got a vision to be healthy, if you've got a vision, whatever that is. When you've got a vision, that, when you've got a vision that's compelling enough, what is the fuel to stop scrolling through Instagram and be like, oh my gosh, I just lost an hour. Is your vision in life being fueled by a life where you regularly scroll through Instagram for an hour? I'm hoping not. I'm really hoping not. I'm not against Instagram. I'm on Instagram. What I'm saying is, if you catch yourself caught up in a string, whoa, I just, I just spent, I just went down a hole of Facebook for 90 straight minutes. If that is fueling your vision, what happens though is oftentimes when there's not a vision, the people cast off restraint. When there's not a vision, we cast off restraint with our, we, we, there are some friends that are not going to take you to where you're trying to go. All things are lawful. All th- Man, I've got a right to any friend I want. True enough. The question is, does the friend that you're going to spend time with this week, do they take you to the vision of where you want to go? Husband. You're like, man, I've got a vision. I want to be a great husband. I tend to find great husbands hang around great husbands. I love when I get around husbands that will say, you will not find me bad-mouthing my wife, and I do not hang out with other people that bad-mouth their wives. 
There's something strengthening about a vision that gives you the self-restraint. Yeah, but, but we agree on politics. Yeah, but we agree on sports. Yeah, but we agree on, yeah, no, I, I get it. They may be fun, but are they been, all things are lawful, but all things are not beneficial. What shows do you watch? What habits do you, do, I, I, I actually think you need to get habits that reinforce the vision of your life. Like, you've got one and only life to live, church. You're gonna stand before God one day on, on the day of judgment. And you don't, I don't think you're gonna wanna say, but Netflix binges was just so compelling. You're not like a rat in a, in a cage. I mean, sometimes I think we are like rats that are they're doing experiments on us from Silicon Valley. I just wanna say to you, get your, write the vision and make it plain and use that vision to be the self-discipline of your life because what you see is what you're gonna get. I'll say it again. What you see is what you're gonna get. It's the fuel, it's the fuel of self-discipline. You want proof of this? We are drawn to people that are self-disciplined. So I'm watching the Olympics yesterday, and did anybody watch the basketball fight, the gold? Who watched the, who watched the gold medal? Did any, I, I wish I, if someone could find the picture for me, I, want it, I would love to put it up next service. So Steph Curry, Steph Curry is dribbling, they're in the finals. I don't know if anyone saw Steph Curry, who is maybe the greatest shooter of all time, and he just puts on, a clinic, a display, a show. It was, I mean, I genuinely felt compassion for the first time in my life for French people, okay? I was like, <laughs> I was like, bless their hearts. I'm not sure if anybody saw this. Steph Curry is like double and triple teamed and there were two other people on the USA team like eight feet away, totally open. Kevin Durant is open. LeBron James is open. The Archangel Gabriel was open. I mean, any sane person in the universe knew, pass the ball to one of the other greatest players that have ever lived while you're being double and triple teamed, and yet it did not matter. Like, the, there's only one person on planet Earth that it is appropriate to shoot when those other guys are open and you are being triple teamed, and that person is Steph Curry. And I'm watching this, and I'm just, I mean, like, in my heart, I don't even know what to say other than you are watching a man who has disciplined himself and 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 disciplined himself. And, disciplined himself, and, disciplined himself. and when you do that, it opens the door so that last week when they were asking all the people, and the, all the Olympians, you know, who do you listen to right before the game, you know, and Kevin Durant was like, I listen to Drake. You know, there are different people, there are different people. They asked Steph, Steph, who do you listen to? He said, I listen to Lecrae. <laughs> a man's gift makes room for him. His gift has made room for him because... He has disciplined himself. He has a vision. He knew he wasn't the tallest guy that ever lived. He knows he's not the biggest guy that ever lived. He knows he's not LeBron James. He knows he's not Kevin Durant. What he knows is who he is. He's Steph Curry. And when you know who you are and you know what you're called to do and you get a vision, vision becomes the fuel of self-discipline. See, I want to be clear with you, church. Let me be crystal clear with you. We have a vision in our church. The vision of our church is not to be an average church. The vision of our church is not to be a normal church with a bunch of believers that come in that have a halfway commitment. We've got a vision to be a church full of disciples. The vision of this church is not half-hearted believers. It is fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples are people, the root word of disciple is discipline. We, it's discipline, it's people. We want a church full full of disciples and leaders and disciplined people that are living with a purpose. Leaders that are leading in whatever sector of society. Wherever you go, I long for the day when people say, whoa, you're in a department at Shands? The best people we could ever hire are disciples of Jesus. I've heard people say Christians are hypocrites. I have never heard people say disciples are hypocrites. We have a vision in this church of disciples. Number one, Vision is the fuel of self-discipline. Number two, vision provides the clarity of focus. 
the clarity of focus. We read here in Habakkuk 2, it says, write the vision and make it plain, make it clear, make it uncomplicated. Before we're done, I'm hoping some of you are going to say, wait a minute, do I have something in writing? Is it in writing for my job? Is it in writing for my family? Is it clear? Is it uncomplicated? Is it written in such a way that people can run with it? I, I, I want to I wanna get I don't want to be harsh on this, but a lot of us are spending our wheels on things we were never called to do. Jesus was in a room in Bethany, and he's sitting down talking, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus live there, and Martha is just at his feet listening. And Martha is running around, and she's waiting tables, and she's doing all sorts of different things, and, and as she is, she says, Lord, can, can you tell my sister to get up and help me? Anybody remember what Jesus says? No. No, get her up. He says, Martha, Martha, you're concerned about many things, but only one thing was needed, and Mary's doing the one thing needed. There's a lot of us that are busy with many things, and we're even trying to get a lot of other people busy with many things. I don't want to be a pastor that's doing many things and trying to get you all to do many things. I want us to be a church of disciples that know the few things we're called to do and we do them with all of our hearts. I want us to burn for the things that God calls us to do, not to fizzle for a thousand different things. Whether you're 80 and retired or eight years old and you're just getting started, I want us to have a church culture that says God has a reason for you to be alive. There is a purpose for you being here. And if you do not know that, it's because the enemy has blinded your eyes. Let the blinders come off in Jesus' name. May you know that you know that you know who you are and what you're called to do so that you can have a clarity, a focus to do the few things God has given you to do. Steve Jobs, he said this, people think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to foc the focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to a hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things that I have done. What are you saying no to? Well, Lord, I want to go clean the house for you. Yeah, but what if the Lord is saying, Martha, I'm not calling you to clean the house. I actually want to bring my teachings in a messy house because I'm trying to make a point right now that I bring truth into messes and I make something beautiful. What if a lot of us are trying so hard with vision that God never gave and we're unfocused on the one thing or the few things that he called us to do? Oh, Jesus, Holy Spirit, show your people what we're called to do. Soviet Union first launched a space satellite, Sputnik 1, in October of 1957. In April of 1961, the Soviets were the first to have a man orbit the Earth. This was the height of the Cold War. Americans were not exactly uh, celebrating this feat, as there was probably some envy, but there was also concern. We were, there was the, the feeling of, of a lowering of prestige, but the bigger deal was an existential threat. Any of you that are old enough will remember the days of duck and cover. Every school had to practice drills for a nuclear war, the, the thing to do was to build nuclear uh, bomb shelters on people's houses if you could do such a thing. The Soviets clearly had the upper, upper hand, and John F. Kennedy, he saw space as huge. His predecessor, President Eisenhower, of course, he disagreed. Six weeks after the Soviet orbit, JFK stood up before Congress, and he made his pitch, and this is what he said. Now is the time for this nation to stake a clearly leading role in space achievement. I believe that this nation should commit itself to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Many people considered him delusional, in the news, they said this was a stunt. Some people said he was nuts. Eisenhower said he was hysterical. Less than half of the U.S. population at the time was in favor of this vision. Yet on 
July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong emerged from the Apollo 11 as the first man to walk on the moon. In less than a decade, the vision that had been written, had been run with, and had come to pass. Vision provides the clarity of focus. Pastor Mike, what are you calling us to do with this sermon today? This is the, this is the application of this message. I want you to write the vision and make it plain. What does it look like to write a vision? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it like this. This is how vision goes, in my opinion. I believe you first identify there is a problem to solve. What is the problem you're trying to solve? So when you're trying to think through, how do I do, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Sometimes I like to ask a question, why does this matter? What's, what's at stake? I, I like to ask, what, what is it that's at stake? So for example, in my family, when Ruthie and I were talking while we were on vacation this week, we said, hey, what's, what's the vision? Like, what's at stake? What, what matters even between now and the end of this year? Like, what are we trying to do as a family? Like, what, what's the, it's like, well, it, it feels like even though there's been time together, sometimes the time is not connected. The, there's, there's a disconnect that's there. What is the problem? What is the challenge? You might say, what is the challenge that you're trying to go after? What is that problem? Next, from a problem, then I'm going to say, you know, what's, what is the, and, and you might say, what is the, the solution? Sometimes I'll say, what's the, what's the solution? Or what's the big idea? You know, or what's the answer? Or what's the strategy? Like, there's a lot of ways that you might say some things like this. Where, where, do, you, where do you go with that? And then from there, then it, you're, going to have, you're going to have an application. You're going to have, there's going to be some sort of, there's going to be some sort of an action, all right? Now, when you're walking through this, you're going to write the vision. You're trying to make this thing plain. So we do this all the time. Someone says, my car is messed up. My car is broken down. Oh, I need to go get a new car. That's my big idea. What am I going to do? I'm going to go. So I want to make this clear. We do vision all the time. We just don't do vision for the things that matter most. We do vision at work. We do vision for a car. Man, I need more. You, you look at someone else and you're, man, I don't have enough followers on whatever. You know, man, I've got, I don't have enough engagement. And so, you're like, man, what's my problem? I don't feel good enough about myself because I don't get enough hearts after my Facebook posts. So what's my solution? I go do a Google search or I do an AI. You know, AI is going to help me do my posts now from now on. And what's my action? I'm going to start posting as often as the, we do this all the time. What we don't do, it's like this. This past year, I, I hit a snag where I had just some concerns with some of my family. And I work a lot. I do. I'm, I'm busy. There's a lot of things that go on. I was burdened. I, I, there was the, the burden of, I want to be able to connect with my children. I've only got them this long. I mean, we, we, we have eight children, but it feels like an empty nest. We only have five kids that are still left at home. There's only five kids left at home. And so for me, I'm like, man... They're not going to be here forever. I could feel that. What's my solution? My solution was, it was the vision. What's the vision? My kids are getting time with their daddy. What was my application of this? Well, how do I do that when I work at a church? How do I do that when I've got lots of late nights? For Mike Pats, what that meant was, as I went through the stuff, I'm like, well, for me, I can't get more time at night. I can get more time in the morning. So I just started coming to the office at five o'clock in the morning. My work day starts at five. I would tell people, I'm like, guys, this is what I'm doing. At three o'clock, I'm going home. I'm gonna go be with my kids. I'm gonna pick my kids up from school on some days. I'm gonna be there with them. I'm gonna do stuff with them. I'm hitting volleyballs with them. So even if I'm gonna work, now I'd like to say this, it's just so obvious, but it's really not. It's like, well, I think everybody would say, well, I want time with my kids. Yeah, well, the question is, but is the, did you write it down and make it clear? I want my children to have connecting time with their daddy on a regular basis. Well, how are you going to do that? I don't get weekends off like a lot of you do. Well, how do I do it? I'll tell you how I do it. Five o'clock in the morning, which means vision is the fuel for my self-discipline. So when nine o'clock comes, I've been a night owl my entire life, my entire life. I stay up till one and two in the morning with ideas. I go to bed at nine or 10 o'clock at night now because I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning because I got to get home by three. So I need an action. I need to write the vision, make it plain that he who sees it can run with that sucker. You're going to have a Bible study. You're leading a microchurch this week and you got this, you see the problem, man, all the people, and we're having a lot of anxiety in our microchurch. That's the problem. What's the solution? Man, I want to do a, a piece. By, by the way, this is how I write sermons. What's the problem? My, the problem I'm addressing in this sermon right now is I see so many Christians that do not have vision. God forbid that Steve Jobs and Walt Disney have better vision than people that have been born again from Jesus Christ. So what's the solution? The solution is people that walk in the power of vision. What's my application? I want you to write the vision. 
My dream even in this sermon is what would be a win in this sermon? I'm hoping hundreds of you say, you know what, I could do that. I could take up, on my phone, I have on my phone affirmations and vision that I just speak every single day. It's in my phone, it's in my journal. I literally speak it out every single day of my life. I mean, some of my affirmations are things like, I'm a son of a good, wise, and loving Abba. Everything I do, I, and everything I do, I follow Jesus, who only did what he saw his father doing. So I'm gonna do what I see my father doing today. So I've got, I've got affirmations of things that I say. There's things that are attached to my vision and identity. I, I write the vision, make it plain that he who sees it can run with it. If you're a school teacher, what's the problem you see? There's, man, there's bullies in my class, all right? What's the solution? And then what's the application? I want you to take this to the Lord and, and say, okay, what, how can this happen? Right now, I'm in the middle of operation election season. What's the problem I see? Christians that act as crazy as the rest of the world when it comes to elections. What's the solution I see? Christians that act more like citizens of heaven than citizens of anywhere else on earth. Christians who know who they are and they know whose they are. And what's the application? We post different, talk different, act different than every. If everybody else is saying it, we're definitely not saying that because we're from another kingdom. We speak and talk and live in ways that people would say, what meaneth this? When you're going on vacation, What's the vision of your vacation? What's your vision for your microchurch this year? What's, your, what's the vision that you have? And of course, you'll attach goals. Of course, you'll do all these other things. But there's a problem, there's a solution, and there's an application. If I stop the sermon here, it would basically be almost a TED Talk, which is why I need to end it with one more point. In Proverbs 29, it does say, without a vision, the people perish. But the word is, if you read it in the New King James, it says, without a revelation, the people cast off restraint. I don't just want you to have vision, although that works. I want you to have divine vision from God because number three, divine vision is the source of holy conviction. Divine vision is the source of holy conviction. I got to go see Dr. Perkins who was with Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy, just a few months back. And when I saw Brian Stevenson, what an honor to meet him and to shake his hand. But when I heard him speaking of his beginnings and how he started, he was studying law, but he was getting disillusioned in law school because he, he got into law to help the poor, but he realized no one's talking about helping the poor in law school. And so he went and he found some lawyers in Georgia and they were just more animated by law than anybody else that he had ever seen. They, they, they seemingly felt called. They would get up early in the morning. They would go to late at night. They would put all of their heart into it. And, and so he kind of did some stuff with them, did some interning and some work with them. And first time he was with a case of someone that was on death row. And a lot of his specialty has been people that have been on death row that they were, they were mentally challenged or they had issues it's like wait how did these people end up on death row and first time he went there they brought a man to him who had been in he was in shackles it took him 20 minutes to unshackle him just to be able to speak to brian stevenson he's been incarcerated for years and he showed up just to let the man know that you're not going to get executed in the next 12 months to which the man was relieved because he just didn't know because no one had come to talk to him for two years he hadn't heard from someone for two years, so at any, you're just kind of wondering every day, when, when could it be? It's sort of an inhumane existence that he was living. They spoke for hours, tears in the man's eyes, they, they connected, and when they were done, the man got up and he hugged Brian Stevenson, and of course they went to go and they reshackled him, but when they did, the guard said he took too long, so the guard began to beat him in front of Brian Stevenson. Even though he was beaten, there was a, a little chipper nature to his heart as he left from being able to connect with someone and even talk to someone about God. And as he left, he began to sing loudly right there in the prison. He says, I'm, I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way. And Brian Stevenson says, it was on that day he knew he could see his purpose. 
He could see the vision. He knew what he was called to do. He was called to help people get to higher ground. He could see it. And he said, now when I went back to law school, I had motivation like I never had. You never, I used to struggle to get to the library. Now I could get to the library. Why? Because vision is the fuel of self-restraint. Now when there was a lot of other things that I didn't have to do, because vision, it's, it's, the, it's the clarity of focus. But it's not just that, it's the, it's the fire of conviction when you know that this isn't just a good idea, but this is a God idea. You see, friends, I, I do want you to go through this process, but when you see a problem, I, if I just end it here, it's really a TED Talk that Steve Jobs could do without God. What I'm telling you is, Habakkuk didn't just look at it. He looked at the world. He said, man, God, I see this, all oh, the injustice and the unrighteousness. And God said, okay. And he, and, but he didn't just go and get a vision. He went and he sought the Lord. In between here and here, you go to God. This is where you go to God. You bring your burden and you lay your burden down to God. You say, God, what do you say about injustice? God, what do you say about this? God, what are you saying about the unrighteousness? God, what are you saying about my family, my marriage, my kids? Lord, what do you say? And you do what he says in verse one. I will stand my watch. I will wait and watch until I see it. Because if you want to see it, you need to see it before you see it. Because what you see is what you'll get. And this is the God, this is the one that when Jesus came to this uncanny number of blind people and he would come to them and say, what do you want? And they would say, Lord, that I can see. I wish that some of us were humble enough to admit we don't have vision right now, but you'd come to Jesus and say, Lord, I can't see where I'm going. I can't see where my family is going, but if you'll touch me, I can see. And he is so good at speaking to people. If, you will, if you'll draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. To which you'd say, yeah, but, but I can't hear him. Mike, how do you do this? I'll tell you how you hear it. Watch, watch. God doesn't shout. He whispers. Which is why if you want to hear him, you need to be near him. I keep hearing people that are saying to me, I don't know what God's vision for my life is. Then you got to shut down Instagram. Then you got to shut down Facebook. You got to shut down YouTube. You got to shut down Netflix. You got to shut down the people that can't stop talking. You got to shut them down and say, God, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. Friends, I will make you a promise. If you belong to Jesus, his sheep know his voice. If you will listen, he will speak. If you'll draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And those that are near him, they hear him. I want some of you teachers to take the bully problem, the depression problem, the suicide problem of your students and to say, not in my classroom. I want, I want some teachers in this church to walk around and say, I dream, I see a classroom that when students walk in here, they feel peace like they don't feel anywhere else. That when they walk in here, they know they are loved. When they are walking here, the worstly behaved among them are going to find a teacher. I'm already ready. I've already put the full armor of God on. I'm ready for anything they bring because as for me in my classroom, this place is going to belong to Jesus Christ businessmen that are going into a meeting and they know you can't be preaching Jesus, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can pray to Jesus before you get in that place and you can bring a presence into that meeting and you can have purposes and motivations and intentions of the heart like nobody else has and that when you walk into that place, you bring the kingdom of God on the earth like it is. And talk about vision. Jesus says, may the kingdom come on the earth like it is in heaven. Can you see it? Because you got to see it before you see it if you want to see it. If you can't see it, you won't see it. Can you see it? Can you see righteousness? Can you see justice rolling like rivers? Can you see anxieties being withered away when, with nothing but a, a touch? This week I saw, talk to a, a Hindu man that had never heard the name of Jesus. And he let me pray over him. And when I said the name of Jesus, he felt something. Can you see it when you go to the restaurant that the name of Jesus has power? Can you see it that when you walk into that boardroom, when you come home from work and you don't want your kids to get your worst and you already know you had a full day, so you sit and you turn the front seat of your car right before your steering wheel into a, a secret place of the most high. 
and you say, Jesus, before I go in there, I'm not gonna complain about the dishes. I'm not complaining about the yard that's not mowed. I'm gonna walk in. I'm bringing the kingdom of God in this family. When, when I walk in, I want my, ch I've got a vision that when I walk in the house, joy comes in with me because they're gonna have a daddy that brings the joy of Jesus Christ. See, the problem is we were, we were born with vision, not just this vision, this vision. We were born with it. The problem is in the Garden of Eden, we lost it. When, when the Bible says on the day that you eat it, you'll die, he didn't just mean you're gonna die. He meant your vision dies, your heart dies. We've got this vision problem. We're, we're so short-sighted. We're, we're giving up health. We're, we'll give up 15 years of life for another trip to the all-you-can-eat buffet. You're like, well, I don't do that. Yeah, but we'll give up our children for a career. We'll give up our spouses to, to have a better looking body at the gym that just looks like fine and toned, but you, you'll lose your marriage for a body? You'll lose your kids for a career? But, but let me take it ultimate. Jesus says in Mark chapter eight, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What does it profit if you've got a vision of, I'm gonna create the next iPhone that we'll forget that in a thousand years? 50 years. What does a prophet, a, a woman, she's got the hottest body you've ever seen. I mean, how hot can a body be for how long? Because there's coming a day called death. It's called the day of judgment. And you will be alive in 10,000 or 10 million or 10 Google years from now. What does a prophet, a man or a woman, if you have a vision for, for another piece of chicken but not health, if you've got a vision for a good life but not a good eternity, what does a prophet, a man, you've got, some of you have friends in your life. You're like, man, we, man, we chill, we hang. Are your friends gonna be in heaven? Because your vision's too short if all you're trying to do is go to a tailgate. I mean, I'm serious. On the day of judgment, you're gonna be answering the question, did you live in a way? Could you, do you see that there is a day that's coming? The Bible says there's, there's appointed once for all men to die, and then comes the judgment. Some of I say, I don't believe in the judgment. That's just because you can't see it. Oh, Lord, open our eyes that we may see. Do you have a vision? For, moms and dads, I appreciate the fact that you want your kid to get on that, in, into that volleyball league. Do you want your kids to get into his ultimate league? That's the, moms and dads, the best vision for your kids is that they know Jesus, that they love Jesus, that they walk with Jesus. In the 10,000 years from now, you won't have to have tears wiped away because you had friends, family, that did not know him. Let, let, me, let me just get crystal clear right now. There are some of you that I'm talking to right now and Jesus had a vision for you. You were his vision. The scripture says he went to the cross and set his face like flint. And they, people tried to dissuade him. Oh, you don't need to go to the cross. Oh no, I'm going to the cross because there was a problem and that problem is people have been separated. It's not just our lost, lack of vision. We're dead. We're dead in our sins. The solution, salvation. The only way this was gonna happen, someone had to pay the price. Jesus goes and pays the price on a cross or he pays for our sins and he redeems us, not just to restore our vision, but to restore our souls. And when we put our faith in him and see what he's done, amazing grace comes upon our life and we get, we get born all over again. And, and just like the blind men of old that said, Lord, I cannot see, but if you'll touch me, I can see. When Jesus touches his soul, he changes them and he makes them new. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I plead with you with all of my heart that this day today, God would give you a vision of eternity that you would know that you will stand before the judgment seat of God. In this very passage in Mark chapter eight where Jesus says, what is a prophet of man? He says, there's coming a day, those that are ashamed of me and my gospel, I'll be ashamed of them. Don't be ashamed of anything revolving around Jesus. Don't be ashamed of any of his kingdom. The one thing that will matter 10,000 years from now is your state and your standing and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, right now, I've got a vision for you, and my vision is that you would know him, that he would open your eyes, that he would forgive your sins, that you would be born all over again, that you would have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you would know that you know that you know that you belong to him because nothing could be of greater importance than that. And I'm about to count to three, and when I say three, if you are not right with God and you know it, I want you to be like, I want you to be humble like the blind man. We read it right here. It says, the proud, he's not gonna make it, but the just shall live by faith. It's an interesting contrast. The opposite of pride, according to this, is faith. That you would humble yourself in faith. Turn to Jesus with all of your heart. If you're here and you are not 
following him. He is not the Lord of your life, the king of your life. This is the day for you to deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him, call upon him, trust in him with all of your hearts, and he will do it. Oh Lord, give me sight. Oh Lord, forgive my sins, and he will do it.